Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Betty Chen. After the November 2023 APEC Summit's Biden Xi meeting, attention has turned to a potential softening in U.S. China relations and Xi Jinping's shift towards a more open diplomatic stance. China's move to grant visa free entry to citizens of five EU countries and Malaysia from December 1st highlights this change, raising questions about the effectiveness of these diplomatic shifts. Joining us today are Cai Rongxiang, National Zhongzhen University Professor of Political Science, and Professor Huang Kuibo, National Zhengzhi University Professor of Diplomacy. A very warm welcome to both of you on the show. Following the Biden Xi meeting, there is speculation whether China has shifted from its previously no wolf warrior diplomacy, given its official media now highlights peaceful coexistence and mutual benefits with the United States, suggesting a new openness to foreign investments. So let me start with my first question, Professor Huang. Do you believe that China has genuinely shifted to a friendly foreign policy, especially after the amicable San Francisco summit with Biden? And this is this last change or merely a temporary shift in China's diplomatic stance? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, mainland China's foreign policy towards the U.S. is somewhat like that of the U.S. towards mainland China. In other words, you know, confront, cooperate, compete, the three moves, you know, will be taken whenever necessary. So that's the strategy of Washington towards Beijing and also, that's the Beijing's strategy towards Washington. So uh, what we have seen at the San Francisco summit between Biden and Xi Jinping indicated that these two gentlemen would like to show a public image of more cooperation, a little bit competition, and probably less attention to confrontation. You know, so. Uh, that's what I think why people think there is an amicable am atmosphere between Biden and Xi Jinping in San Francisco. But as I said, that's the public image these two gentlemen would like to show to the general public in the world. So what in the world is it when the two gentlemen spoke at the closed door meetings? We have no idea. So as I said, you know, competition remains probably the most important issue between the two great powers and cooperation also being emphasized especially when they talk about like climate change international anti-terrorism but confrontation especially in the fields of trade and of science and technology warfare quote-unquote warfare i think you know this remains some hot topics between these two gentlemen so these seemingly amicable atmosphere between Biden and Xi Jinping, you know, is a way to show that these two leaders need a very good and stable environment for themselves to manage their own domestic issues and problems. Also, I would like to emphasize that Xi Jinping's proposal for some like mutual benefits between mainland China and the US and provide some public goods to the international society. You know, all these are reflecting what Xi Jinping has proposed in October 2017 at Chinese Communist Party's National Congress, the 19th National Party mm -hmm. Congress. You know, Xi Jinping at that time proposed a community with a shared future for mankind. So with that thread of thought, Xi Jinping has developed three different kinds of initiatives like development, security, and civilization. So I, I think based on this, Xi Jinping would like to show to the world that you know, when the US has been in chaos in politics and the US is failing to lead the free world or the whole world for globalization, and mainland China is the one that would like to take the lead to help others to move forward. I think that's, the, that's why Xi Jinping has tr been trying to show his goodwill to the US. A and, and also the US would like to you know, accept that because the US cannot compete, cannot confront mainland China on every aspect. But in general, I will say, I will say that when, when the US campaign is approaching, I think maybe U.S. management relations will see some turns, you know, maybe unexpectedly. 
So, Professor Huang, you just mentioned the three elements, including confrontation, uh, competition, and cooperation. Now, I'd like to raise my question to Professor Tsai. So, is Xi Jinping's diplomatic shift a, to a response, uh, response to the negative outcomes of previous hardline tactics, especially given regional nations like the Philippines, India, Australia, and Vietnam are strengthening ties with the U.S.? What's your take on this? Okay, uh, when China has been coercing or intimidating uh, neighboring countries, such as you mentioned, the Philippines, India, Australia, uh, and Vietnam, the policy backfired because this kind of policy just pushed those countries further toward the United States. Now we see that U.S. got new military uh, bases in the Philippines and reached up the military cooperation uh, with U.S. because uh, they tried to fend off uh, Chinese uh, aggression, especially in the, they try to use great wrong operation in the EEC wrong of the Philippines. And the relations between US uh, and India are deepening. And they try to conduct a joint military exercise in Alaska every year, every year. Australia is the same thing. They, Australia is getting 12 uh, nuclear submarines from the US and the UK. And Vietnam is considered a potential, uh, to be a potential ally for the United States. So those are uh, actions because something to do with uh, China threats, especially if you see South Korea and Japan. They used to be uh, enemies, political field, right? But these days they mend their, uh, they mend their fence and they try to cooperate with the United States. So it, it forms a trilateral uh, alliance. So basically, I would say this. Thanks to China, United States did not, did not have to spend a lot of time to, you know, consolidate with allies, right? Because, you know, Americans, they try to say, okay, the allies, you have to pull your weight, right? Because this is very, very important. But because of the China, uh, those allies try to work with U.S., uh, try to uh, get a better relationship. This is the scenario China does not want to see. Okay, that's my position. Yeah. So you just mentioned that now because of the actions by China. So these neighboring countries are actually trying to build closer alliance with the United States. So China's official media, which framed the U.S. as a chaotic actor during the spy balloon incident, abruptly changed its tone post the Biden Xi meeting, advocating for the normalization of Sino-American relations from anti-American to American friendly. So what are the factors behind this kind of change in the stance? Professor? Okay, I, I think the reason could be fourfold. First one, as I said, you know, mainland China has been trying to show its goodwill by proposing this community for a shared future for mankind since 2017. And second, is that you know, uh, mainland China cannot respond to the U.S. as it wishes, especially when the U.S. is launching like trade war or science technological war against mainland China because mainland China's capability in general are still inferior to those of the U.S. And third, it, that I, I think uh, both leaders in Beijing and in Washington, as I mentioned earlier, need a stable milieu for themselves to handle their internal issues like economic slowness or like social unrests, something like that. And last but not least, the reason could be, you know, I, I think in a way these two leaders have some, you know, tacit understanding or even some coordination between them in order to create a controllable environment because Xi Jinping, as I said, is facing some internal problems right now and Biden is going to, you know, engage his presidential election for, uh, in November 2024 very soon. So stable and controllable environment would be beneficial for the both leaders. So talking about having a controlled environment, China's Taiwan's Affairs Office gathered 300 Taiwanese business delegates in Beijing for a seminar expressing their desire to steer cross-strait relations back to peaceful development. Are these friendly gestures and actions really intended to ease global apprehensions about China and security um, in Asia? Professor Tsai. Okay, the thing is that they've been trying to do this, we call this United Front Strategy. 
they try to uh, talk to uh, Taiwanese businessmen in China and try to ask them, uh, when you have a chance, you go back home and to support some Chinese, uh, China-friendly candidates. This, is, this has been you know, very, very normal for China to intervene in Taiwan's elections. Okay? Not only that, they try to use some uh, cognitive warfare, right? and they, uh, they spread uh, this information, especially they try to use social media to say something bad about the Taiwanese government and some candidates. And in the meantime, this year, they invited some uh, chiefs of village in Taiwan. They offered them some cut price trip to, to China. And the thing is that they try to brainwash them so they can, you know, they can come back to Taiwan and they can support for a specific party. So China has been doing this because this is, uh, there's a saying uh, in English, we need to uh, we need to pay close attention to friends, but we have to pay close at attention to enemies because China has been doing this for uh, many, many, many years. But the, uh, this time, maybe they try to have a new tech, tech tactic. So this is we have to uh, pay a close eye on this, especially during the, the campaign period. So what's the original, do what's the real intention behind these seemingly friendly gestures? Uh, the thing is that because uh, for Xi Jinping, uh, his prey is full, right? He got a lot of problems domestically, but internationally he wants to have a good uh, image for the countries in the global south. Mm -hmm. And he knows, like Professor Wang say, you know, Biden, Biden's hands are full because the war uh, of uh, Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Hamas. So, and also his re-election campaign. Mm -hmm. So he got his hands full. So that's why Xi Jinping wants to deliver an Oliver branch, mm -hmm. right? For mm -hmm. domestic audiences and for international audiences because the economy is very, very important. And also he's busy for party purge. You know, he liked, he, he has some issue of the change of the ministers, right? you don't even know where they are now. This is so scary, <laughs> okay? Somebody said Qing Gang was gone, was dead, you know? This is terrible. This is, you know, this is not something we can imagine in democracies. So we talked about something heavy right here. So <laughs> let's talk about something lighter on a lighter note. So Professor Huang, you just talked about the shared future of mankind. So mm -hmm. I think animals also plays a very important part. China's use of pandas as a diplomatic tool evident in Xi Jinping's recent offer to send pandas to California following the return of three from Washington's Smithsonian National Zoo raises questions about the effectiveness of this soft power strategy. So what are your thoughts on the impact? So the so-called panda diplomacy. You know, quite a few press around the globe said that this is the failure of mainland China's panda diplomacy or soft power diplomacy, you know, which might be true because we really have no clue what was behind the scene when the U.S. zoos would like to return all these pandas back to mainland China. So I, I do not exclude the possibility that, yes, you know, a lot of American zoos are paying more attention to the soft power or panda diplomacy conducted by mainland China. But that's just one aspect of the whole explanation or the whole fact. Uh, if I can develop my own reasoning on the basis of the following four factors, you know, which are irrelevant to politics, then I think you know, perhaps the audience would have a better understand understanding about this panda diplomacy you know, without too much political influence. Mm -hmm. First, you know, pandas, you know, the panda market, you know, are monopolized by the Chinese authorities. Okay, so each panda in foreign zoos will cost the zoo more than one million US dollars per year by contract. Per panda? Per panda, per panda. <laughs> so they are expensive, they're expensive. Uh, so if the zoos cannot afford such a cost or the zoos would like to you know, reallocate some of the budget from pandas to other species or animals, mm -hmm. then they may be going to do it by sending pandas back to mainland China after the contract. 
Okay, and the second factor is that, you know, it takes a lot of time and money to take good care of these pandas. Like, uh, uh, they need, pandas need delicate care. Like, they need fresh bamboos, fruits, they better stay in uh, air-conditioned rooms. No, they spoiled animals. So, yeah, so <laughs> such a spoiled animals, and that need money. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, pandas need some very, you know, modern scientific medical care, mm -hmm. like human beings. These also needs money. So money, money, money. You know, these two factors, the, f uh, the, the two factors I've mentioned are all about money. And the third factor is the fact that actually pandas are no more the most endangered species or animals in the world. You know, they are still endangered, but they are not as you know, endangered as they were in like 20, 30, 40 years ago. For example, now in Sichuan and the whole mainland China, I counted uh, that there might be about 1,900 uh, pandas, either captive or wild. So the number is not great, but at, at least panda has been removed from the most endangered mm -hmm. animals in the, on, on the list. Okay, and last factor is that you know, the US, some of the US zoos that have sent back the pandas back uh, to Manila, China said, this has nothing to do with foreign policy or politics. It's totally the, our internal consideration. Mm -hmm. So with these four factors, so whether or not it's a politics issue or it's a non-politics issue, it's your call. What's your take on this, Professor? Okay, let me say a few things. In, uh, in, U in US, uh, hawks on China that used to call people uh, are supportive of the uh, uh, pro-China policy, they call them panda huggers, mm -hmm. panda huggers. Because China to try to use uh, panda uh, to be a propaganda, right? Because when uh, there was a deputy secretary, uh, Robert Rosick, and he went to China, he went to Sichuan province, and he was hugging a baby panda, mm -hmm. right? And China tried to say, oh, this is a good guy because he tried to have a good relationship with China. But the thing is that, you know, when you have a terrible relationship with China and somebody would just say, okay, uh, you are the panda hugger. So the thing is that China has to uh, pull pandas off the hook, okay? Because if China wants to have a good relationship, uh, have a good image, uh, image around the world, sometimes you, can, you have to delink mm -hmm. the pandas and diplomacy, like Professor Huang said, right? Pandas are, are adorable to kids. Kids like to go to see pandas in a row, right? But the things that they try to name the pandas, especially in Taiwan, is about something to do reunion. It's about reunification. Right, many kind of twan twan yeah, yeah, twan twan, right? yeah, but <laughs> twan twan was dead, right? Mm -hmm. Now only have three female uh, pandas. Mm -hmm. That's fine, you know. We we don't want to parti uh, politicize that kind of stuff, right? Animals are just animals. Mm -hmm. They are cute. That's fine. I I I had a chance to see that, mm -hmm. right? But if you try to get involved in politics, uh, I don't think it's a good idea. So talking about a soft power strategy, Xi Jinping has recently adopted a strategy of visa-free diplomacy, complementing traditional media efforts and panda diplomacy to foster positive international relations. During the China-Singapore summit in Tianjin, both countries not only strengthened their partnership, but also introduced a 30-day reciprocal visa waiver. Additionally, starting December 1st, China unilaterally granted visa-free entry to nationals from France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, and Malaysia drink close to 7,000 visitors to China without visas in the initial three days alone. So, Professor Huang, in addition to enhancing tourism, are there any other dis uh, significant diplomatic advantages to the visa-free policy? Okay, uh, before I answer your question, I would like to say that, you know, uh, in fact, there are quite a few factors influencing foreigners' decision to pay a visit to mainland China. In addition to the visa issue we're going to talk about, you know, um, these flights and flights ar flight arrangements, you know, right after the COVID, it's also very difficult for foreigners. 
even for some of our Taiwanese people. Not to mention uh, the internet control and the use of mobile phone to pay almost everything on the markets, on the streets, would be inconvenient for foreigners. Among other factors, you know, that tell you why foreigners may not want to visit mainland China as they did before. Okay, so visa-free. You know, visa-free, usually you either trust that country and, their, uh, that and its people, or you have some request or expectation out of these countries, you are going to give your the visa-free status. Visa-free is not really free, I mean, right? It's, it's <laughs> not free. And sometimes, you know, uh, like uh, uh, visa upon land, mm -hmm. uh, landing. Landing visa. Landing visa is also not free. But it's, you know, something we call the visa-free or broadly defined visa-free. Okay, so, of course, to track tourists is one of the most important considerations for the Chinese authorities because uh, before the COVID, I think the number of foreign visitors to and leave mainland China reached 48.8 million. Okay, but uh, the first half of this year, 2023, only 8.4 million. Mm. That's a huge deduction in terms of numbers of foreign visitors. So uh, in terms of diplomacy, you know, by giving visa free to some selected country citizens, can these people visiting mainland China know better the current developments on mainland China? Probably good because they usually pay visit to big cities. Okay, so they will feel, okay, this is part of soft diplomacy conducted by the mainland Chinese government. And also, you know, by giving some visa free status to foreigners, can the mainland Chinese authorities attract more foreign investments to mainland China because then you know getting into mainland China will be easier than you know during the COVID. And last but not least is of course you know mainland China could attract foreign students and faculty members to mainland China, which again is part of the soft power diplomacy that needs to be further conducted by the Beijing authorities. And that's probably some of the main reasons why mainland China is issuing visa-free to some selected countries. Mm -hmm. So now, um, Professor uh, Tsai, how do you interpret Xi Jinping's strategy towards Europe, especially after the meeting with EU leaders at the EU-China summit, despite the economic disagreements? Yes, because uh, China is offering some visa-free policy, right? It's a very, very good diplomatic gesture. But the reality is they need to talk about uh, substantive policies, especially China and EU. Xi Jinping met with European uh, Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen and European C Council President Charles uh, Michel just a couple of days ago. And they talked about the trade imbalance because uh, there's a huge imbalance between EU and China. And EU wants China to, to have fair competition. So that's more important than just some free visa tourism because EU try to talk to China, not to help Russia because the war is going, is ongoing, right? And also especially not help Russia with some military weapons or even military parts, that kind of stuff. So this is more important than just giving uh, some nice gesture and then uh, we offer you visa free because the, the real beef of the policy is the trade stuff, okay? This is more important. It's not, uh, EU is not trying to use this uh, to, uh, uh, to be a leverage against China, right? But that's, they have to deal with the differences. They have to resolve the, the differences. Before, Xi Jinping has a terrible uh, treatment to von der Leyen, right? Mm -hmm. But nowadays, because the Chinese economy is going down, so he changed his attitude, right? So you can tell the situation in China is getting so bad. That's why he changed suddenly, right? It's kind of out of the blue, right? Just uh, try to overhaul the whole problem in China. That's his concern now. 
So going back to the visa-free uh, policy, I just want to know what's your view on the possibility whether the visa-free scheme will be further expanded to other maybe non-EU countries or will the visa-free status be extended to longer period? What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think this visa-free status will be given to more countries whenever needed. Because you know now uh, a lot of uh, domestic a lot of economic growth of mainland China depends largely on domestic markets, but foreign visitors, including those white collars and and th these these top leaders, also need to you know show their you know interest in mainland China so that you know more investment opportunities would go to mainland China, and not to mention you know visa free status is a way to show friendly attitudes mm -hmm. toward other countries. Okay, Professor Tsai, what's your take? Maybe this is just like the olive branch that you mentioned? Yes, uh, because uh, you can, because of some countries, like European countries, uh, they are afraid they are Chinese visitors because some of them, they, they carry some face, you know, passports, right? Because they try to uh, migrate uh, to some foreign countries. They use face, uh, pseudo pa uh, passports, that kind of stuff. But if they try to uh, have a good relationship with some European countries, I think this is uh, very, very important, right? Especially, you know, before they try to use a uh, wolf warrior diplomacy, now maybe they, they try to change, it's like a soft power diplomacy. I think it's a good thing, right? Because you, sometimes you are uh, doing something like angry birds, it's not good <laughs> for your, you know, your image. That right. kind of stuff, right? So maybe time for change. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your okay. time. If you like our show, please search for us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.